Hello everyone, my name is Josh Briggs, and this is a lesson today for Algebra 1 about building functions, which is a very important concept to master for the course of Algebra 1. So I'm going to share my screen with you so we can move into our lecture slides for today. So building new functions, very important topic in Algebra 1 that you must master in the course. So in the Michigan Standard, there is an objective that says that we want to understand the effect of replacing a function f of x, a general function, with different values of k. So we can add k, which is called a translation. We can subtract k, which is called a translation. We can do that operation on the inside of the outside, and we can also multiply by k, which is a constant. And that will also change the graph as well, which is called a transformation. So we'll move into those in a second and understand a little bit better what that is. So for this, we will use the general parent function, which is f of x equals x squared. <clears throat> this is a function that runs through the origin. It's quite easy to understand and look at from a graphical perspective, which is why we're going to use it for this. And additionally, it has this squared function on here, the squared operation, which makes it pretty easy to look at what are called inside changes, which is what we'll look at in a second. And those are changes that you do on the inside of the operation, which, which are a little bit more difficult to envision if you're dealing with something like a linear function because there is no operation other than uh, just simply the multiplication on the x. So we could use any parent function for this, but we'll use this one because it is very easy to visualize for this exercise. So we first must understand what is shifting a graph? Well, a shift is when you take the same shape of the graph, you don't actually change the shape at all, you don't stretch it or compress it or anything, but you just move it. So we're moving over to the left in this case. And then here you can see moving the graph up or down, you could do either of those operations as well. So that's called a shift. You're not you're not changing the shape. You're not altering the general structure of it, other than you're just moving it to a new location, and that is a translation as well. So how would you algebraically express a vertical transformation? Well, what you can do this is called an outside change. It is when you add a value of a constant. It could be any constant to the function. You don't do anything to the inside operation, you just add or subtract a constant. So in this case, that we're calling that constant k, and if you add a value of k, <clears throat> it will translate your function upward or downward in a vertical direction. Adding is upward, subtracting is downward. So my question for you is, given this, this graph right here of f of x equals x squared, if you perform the transformation adding five, that's also a translation. What would the end graph look like? What would that do to this graph? So I'll give you a second to think about that and ponder what that would look like. Okay, hopefully you've had a second to think about that. And we'll move on to the answer and discuss it. So this is what the answer would be. You are taking the graph of x squared and you're simply shifting it up five along the y-axis. So that is your first translation that you've, that you've done. So congratulations. And uh, you know, you'll notice that the shape is exactly the same. We didn't do anything to that. We just simply moved it up five. So then let's do the antithesis of that, which is a downward translation. So this would be when you add a negative value or subtract a positive value. You can look at it whichever way you want, but we're subtracting a positive value here. So that's the negative five, which is our value of K. So think about this for a second. What would this look like if I performed this translation can you imagine what this graph would look like? Maybe sketch it on a piece of paper and you know, talk about it with a neighbor. Okay, well, this is what it would look like. It's simply a downward shift of the function down five because you subtracted five or whatever your value of K is. It could be you know 100 and then you're moving it down 100. And so this is what the end result would look like. And that makes sense because the graph has stayed the same, but we just simply shifted it. <coughs> well, what is a horizontal trans transformation, also called a translation. We can move things up and down, we know now, but we can also move them left to right. This is called an inside change, which is an, when you add or subtract a value on the inside of the operation. This is why we are using the x squared uh, function, the quadratic function, because it's pretty easy to visualize this. If you had a line, an inside change and an outside change are actually the exact same thing, so it's pretty hard to visualize. So that's why we, why we use this function, because it makes it quite easy to, to look at that. So when you add values inside the operation, it actually shifts your function left. And then when you subtract uh, values of k to your function, it actually shifts your function to the right. Now, at first that seems kind of 
antithetical to what you'd expect because you think, well, this is the positive x axis, this is the negative x axis. So if I'm adding, I should shift right. If I'm subtracting, I should shift left, just like what I saw with the vertical translations. But if you think about it mathematically, and specifically algebraically, you'll understand that if you add values of k, what, what's actually happening is you're saying that you need to have you need to have a higher value of x to reach a given value of y. So what that means is for whatever value of x you're putting in, not, not k, but whatever value of x you plug in right here for your function to, to plot it, you're actually going to be five further left. So if you think about it algebraically, it starts to make a little bit more sense. So think about this example for a second. What would happen if I added five to the inside of this operation? What would my resulting function look like? Talk about it with a neighbor, plot it down on a piece of paper, and just think about that. Okay, well, this is what we found. We shifted it five to the left, which is exactly what we expected because we are adding to the inside and that shifts it to the left. So one more transformation. What would happen if I subtracted five on the inside? So remember we talked about the fact that the subtractions on the inside of the operation actually translate your function to the right. So this would shift my function to the right. So I kind of gave you the hint, but think about that for a second and what that would look like, plot it down. And we find this, our original function is in red, our new function is in blue, and we shifted it exactly over five to the right, which is what we expected. And you can see the shapes are still exactly the same. So those were all translations, mean, meaning the function graph stays the same. But what would happen if I wanted to change my shape of the function? So I can do that. I just need to know how. Well, you can do it with, with what are called compressions and stretches, which is when you multiply by k, a value of k, a constant, it will change the shape. If you do, if you multiply on the outside of the operation, like we see right here, that's called an outside change because you're multiplying the outside of the function. When k is greater than one, the function is stretched vertically. So if you think about the function as a rubber band, kind of pulls it. Um, if k is less than one, then it's going to be vertically compressed. I mean, if you think about a rubber band, you kind of squish it together, it gets wider and wider, and you reach values of y at higher values of x. So. Think about this example right here, our value of k in this case is going to be 3, according to this form. So it's greater than 1, so it's going to be stretched. So think about what that what would that look like if I wanted to replot this graph. What would that look like from a visual standpoint? Okay, hopefully you get a second to think about that. So our original function here is shown in red, our new function in blue. And you can see that, we're, that if you imagine that rubber band, you know, when you're pulling it, it's like you're stretching it out. And that's what we see here is the blue has gotten significantly stretched out. It's we're reaching values of y at lower values of x, which is what happens when you stretch. So then thinking about what's called a vertical compression, what would happen when my value of k is less than 1 but greater than 0? So that's, that's saying that 0 0.1 or 0 0.5 or 0 0.7, any of those decimal values in between 0 and 1, what, what would happen to the graph? Well, we said that essentially you'd be compressing the graph because what you're saying is you're going to reach a given value of y at a higher value of x. So imagine that, what would this look like if you were to apply this compression by multiplying by, the, by k equals 0 0.1? So think about that for a second, talk to a neighbor, kind of jot it down on a piece of paper. Well, this is what it would look like, original function in red, new function in blue, We've significantly compressed our rubber band. It's a lot wider now. We're reaching given values of y at significantly larger values of x. Like even right here, you can see at x is 10, y is 10, whereas here, uh, x is 10 is reached at about y equals, looks like 2.5 or so, or actually about three. So that's exactly what we expected. It was compressed by a factor of 10. So one more example about this. Uh, what happens when you multiply on the inside? by k. So those are called inside changes. When k is greater than 1, the function is going to be compressed horizontally, meaning it gets narrower. So thinking about compressing your rubber band from the side, that's similar to what we saw with the vertical stretch, actually. And then when k is less than 1, the function is going to be stretched horizontally, meaning you're pulling in your rubber band and you're just kind of ripping it apart, which is what you expect. So get, looking at this example, k equals 3, in terms of it's an inside change because it's inside the x squared. What would you expect this graph to look like 
after that after that operation is performed. So it can be graph that down, talk to a neighbor, think about how that how different would that look. Well, <clears throat> so here's our here's our answer right here. Uh, our original function is shown in red. Our new answer is shown in blue. And imagine your rubber band. I think that's a good visual to think about. You've got your rubber band. You're compressing it, so it's getting narrower and narrower. And that's exactly what we see here as it gets very, very narrow. And that's because k is greater than 1. So it's horizontally compressed by a factor of 3. So then here, horizontal stretch is our last example. What happens when k is less than 1? Well, it's going to be the exact opposite. So horizontally, you're actually going to be stretching that rubber band. So in this example, k is one third, which is less than one, but greater than zero. What would you expect this final graph to look like after we performed this horizontal stretch? And, and you notice it's an inside change. That's kind of your key indicator that you should notice with that. So graph it down, think about it with a friend. So here's our final answer. Our original graph is in red, new answer is in blue. You'll notice that we horizontally stretched our rubber band out and kind of pulled it apart. And that's exactly what we expect. So I hope this is helpful to you. I'm, now I will open up for questions. Uh, I want to help you understand this as best I can. So I would love to answer any questions that you'd have. And then additionally, we'll move on to a group worksheet where we'll test some of your understanding of this. And then I can come around to your individual groups and help you to understand it a little bit better and to grasp the concepts. And then additionally, at the very end, we'll go through an individual worksheet so I can evaluate your individual understanding and help you to learn this better. So now that we've wrapped up the lesson, what, what I would usually do is throughout the lesson encourage to do an encourage student participation. I would call on in individual students and ask for their their ideas and their thoughts and their their comprehension of the concepts that are discussed to get a better idea of, of where they're, what they're, where they're at and what they're thinking. That, that's what I would do to get a little bit of individualized student data so, so I can, as a teacher, have observations about how they're doing. And then additionally, before my lessons, I had to confer with IEP to ensure that any assistive technology that's being used in the class is in compliance with expectations. And then finally, at the very end, I'll do an individual worksheet for everybody that they would turn in at the end. And that would give me a little bit of individualized data to make sure that everybody's staying roughly at the same pace in terms of understanding things. And if there were to be, let's say, a collective lag in the understanding of the class, then at the next lesson, potentially revisit that, maybe do a quiz or maybe a game. Uh, I think a lot of times you can do really fun games in math. You can do math jeopardy, let's say. It's something that a lot of students really enjoy, so you can test those concepts and, and do that. And they tend to really have a lot of fun with that. Uh, additionally, you can do some group activities where kids get to collaborate with each other and share their understanding. Maybe one kid understands vertical shifts, another kid understands horizontal compressions better. So then they can share those understandings and help, to help each other learn. Because I think when kids kind of teach each other, they tend to learn a lot better than you know, just when they're teaching themselves or when I'm teaching them. Because if you teach somebody something, a lot of studies show that, that you actually have much better attention of those concepts later. And I, want, and I want students to get to know each other too, because I think that will help them be more engaged with the course and, and to appreciate it as not just an academic experience, but also a, uh, a social experience too. So those are some things that I would keep in mind. And then of course, if any kids are struggling in the course, I would always remain in communication with them, help them answer questions, and if necessary, maybe direct them to uh, intervention and so then get some differentiated instruction. I would definitely try to differentiate my instruction as much as possible uh, to accommodate kids who are who are struggling, maybe revisit certain subjects that, that they're struggling with, or given my knowledge of them as, as individuals, maybe I could make a math topic that's about something they're interested in. Maybe instead of uh, discussing math in kind of a, a decontextualized uh, context, you could look at it's from maybe a football context. So maybe when you're looking at quadratics, you're looking at the flight of a football, and that's something that maybe is more interesting to them. So individualized instruction in that way. So thank you very much for your attention, and thank you very much for your consideration, and I appreciate your time.